what do we refer them for? What do we, what's going on when we refer them? And exactly when is the best time to refer our kids to a certain specialty services? And this isn't a referral talk per se. It's more, what are the issues that some of our kids face? How do we come to understand them? And how do we start to approach them? The reason why we did this talk was at the last refresh conferences, people would stop and say, may I have just five minutes? I'd like to talk to you about my child because we're running into this problem and we were wondering what we could do about it. And so I give a referral. And Michelle Snyder said right from the podium, Deborah Gray just spent less than five minutes on the phone, gave me a referral for somebody really important for my son's well-being, and it made all the difference. And I'm like, I hope I did a good job on that because I don't know if I did or not, but apparently, you know, even a blind pig finds an acorn once in a while, and it was just the, the correct <laughs> remedy for the day. And um, I don't mean to be too humorous at, at my own expense. But anyway, what I thought is that we could go through some things that we're seeing with kids and where to send people. And because we have a diverse audience here, although I know some of the referrals in the general Seattle area. Yolanda Compran is joining me today. Come on and join me for a second. <coughs> Yolanda has the Adoption Referral and Information Service, and she knows a lot of the resources, not just in the Puget Sound, but down the coast into California, over into other parts of the Pacific Northwest. And if she doesn't know it, she'll tell you where to go in a nice way. Okay, so I'll come get. So, do you want to say anything at this point? I'll start in on the slide sets, and then when you have something to say, you have a mic, so just you know, turn it on and join in. So the first thing, when we have kids who are coming into our families, the very first thing you want to do is get a medical assessment. You have, if you have a child who's coming from an international community, I strongly suggest the Center for Adoption Medicine at the University of Washington. Often for our foster kids, this is a great idea too, but especially if you're coming in internationally, we have unique syndromes that we're looking for, or unique intestinal bugs that we're looking for at the Center of uh, Adoption Medicine, and they're just the pros. I like them because they have longer appointment periods of time than a typical provider can have. Uh, they're grant supported in part through our, or not grant supported, tax supported through our funds at the University of Washington. And so with these longer periods of time in which they can see our kids. I also like them for our kids who have been adopted through the foster care system or who are being fostered because you can use your medical coupons there and get very high quality care. Even if you don't want to stay with them into the future, they're great as the first stop. So that's a little plug for them. You can just go online and you'll see the Center for Adoption Medicine if you need the number. Um, what I've done is I've taken frequent numbers that people ask for and I've written them into a large handout. I'm emailing that to Michelle Snyder. Actually, I already emailed it to her. And they'll probably put this up on the website after the conference so that you can just hit that and have some of these basic numbers. Then if you think your child has been prenatally exposed to alcohol or drugs, you know, in most of the kids from Eastern Europe have been, some of the kids from Africa have been uh, exposed to homebrew. You have kids from our foster care system. Most of the kids have been prenatally exposed. It's very nice to stop at the FASD clinic, and they've got a one-stop um, a one-stop there where you spend four hours, you get all the professionals to look at your kid, the psychologist, the speech and language person, someone who's looking at behavior, somebody who's looking uh, at the child's medical issues and you know how drugs and alcohol might have affected them. And then they get together and they brainstorm and come up with referrals to services for your child. Now how good is that? 
and they can connect you with Julie Gilo, who is just a wonderful resource. And again, you can use your medical coupons for it. The cool thing is, the, co the pediatricians who are with the FASD clinic are also the pediatricians at the Center for Adoption Medicine, or two of them are. And that would be Julian Davies and Julie Bledsoe. They're uh, nationally famous, and so you have that nice continuity. So that's somebody who really gets your kid. The next thing, my kid seems behind in every area, but she's only two years old. Should I wait and see? No. Run. Don't walk. Get early intervention. You can get early intervention from everything from attachment on through behavioral health. That is, your kid is having too wide of moods and behavior tantrums for her age, to um, occupational therapy, physical therapy, work with sensory integration therapy through lots of different programs. In our area, child, uh, the Kindering Center is a great resource, and um, Child Find is available through the schools. If you look under birth to three in a Google search, you'll find what the keywords you're looking for are early intervention specialists. Because what we found is that the brain is very plastic, not plastic like a plastic bag, but it's very moldable in those early years. And that's where we get the real big gains without as much effort. You want to get in as quickly as possible. Don't wait and see. The great news is most of this is free through Child Find Birth to Three services. And so you can get a lot of help without a uh, a lot of expenditure. Another thing, does my kid have ADD? Well, it would be really important for you to know that according to the research of Ira Chasnoff, 76% of the kids who have prenatal exposure will have ADD. Did you hear that statistic before? And it's, it's kind of daunting, isn't it? Because if we know that, you know, if we're adopting, from a pool of kids, or fostering a pool of kids who have been prenatally exposed, the three out of the four of them are going to have ADD. Wouldn't you want to know something about specialized parenting? I've had a few people say, well, why would you want to put a label on them so soon? Well, why do you think we'd want to put a label on? To help them. So people don't look at them in a negative way, but they realize that this is a brain-based difference. And we'll have to accommodate in school. We might want to get some special protection in school. One of my special protections that I like for kids with ADD or prenatal exposure is I like to have teacher preference listed in the Section 504 or IEP accommodations. Everybody knows that there are weak teachers, disorganized teachers, and there are very structured, very kind, patient teachers. Who do we want our kids in with? Structured, structured patient. And then we get some people who are kind of mad at some of the kids who have behavioral problems and ADD. So they decide they're going to give them not to the structured, kind teacher, but to the structured mean teacher. We want to avoid that because it really sets off our traumatized kids. They feel like they're back in a domestic violence situation, which many of them have been through. So this is very protective for them. And we can help our children be perceived differently. Um, when to get the diagnosis? If your child has been in placement for about a year, that's a good time to go get a diagnosis. Now, I don't know about you, but when I have too much change and too much coming at me, I have a really hard time concentrating, right? You, any of you have that same situation? And so there are times where I've been overstimulated and I really look like I have ADD. I'm forgetful, you know, I am distractible, I can't find words. You know, I'm obviously having a hard time with too much information in my brain. And so many of our kids will look ADD right after a move. And so we don't necessarily want to run right out and get diagnosis for them. But if maybe they've been through three or four moves in the past, 
then you wouldn't have that one year rule. You would be like, oh, this kid has had a succession of moves. And so probably the ADD and diagnosed has had something to do with it. Also, if we look at kids who are moved between the ages of two and four, we find that a higher rate of them have ADD. And there's something about early neglect that causes a higher rate of ADD because some neural systems that are supposed to be developing optimally with a primary caregiver are being developed without that primary caregiver. And so there's a, a lot of really high stress hormonal activity in the system. And these high circulating glucocorticoids really influence the executive systems of the brain. I'm not going to go into a large explanation, but this is the, the short take home story for that. If those executive systems include effortful attention, and so we're not getting the optimal development of effortful attention, and it really undermines it. Another big thing that's being undermined is something called theory of mind. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. But theory of mind is that ability to feel your own thoughts and feelings and be able to predict what that other person might be thinking. They have a really hard time understanding the point of view of another individual. And we're not even sure why that is yet. But both of those are things that we will have to be paying special care to after children come into the home, especially if they've been running really high stress in the first year of life and then especially ongoing. And if we are in the high risk pool for our kids, we have kids with five or more placements, and that includes those short two weeks with like a kinship caregiver, then those kids are really shaped by all those moves and it will have an impact. And so they'll have more difficulty settling down. They will be doing anxious scanning. They'll be more behaviorally difficult. So some of those kids, we want to settle as much as possible, but you know, we really won't know if they have ADD for about that first year. You can go to get diagnosis before if you know where they were before and you'd see, oh, this is an ongoing problem. But for a lot of the kids, um, we're, we're looking at the ADD qualities. We think, is this developmental? Is this prenatal exposure? Is this a response to moves? You know, if you think that the placement is in jeopardy unless you get the kids diagnosed and some medication for them, then by all means, run, don't walk. Don't put this, through, this child through another foster care move. One of the things people hesitate to do is to put kids on medication. And yet, we found that the kids do so much better as a group. Not everyone, but as a group on medication with ADD. The brain has been shaped in many cases by their prenatal experience, their postnatal experience. And so we're trying to help the brain in how we're working with the brain. Many of the kids don't do as well with the stimulant if they were prenatally exposed to alcohol, drugs in the first 10, 12 weeks of life. We actually do better <coughs> with a medication called guanfacine, trade name in tuna, because that turns back some of the high stress systems of the brain that are turned up a little bit too high for high response. Anybody have questions at this point? Because I kind of shoot through and uh, am known for not taking a breath. Yes? Yeah, it's a really good question. She said, how often do kids have theory of mind and ADT, DD? Do they go together? <coughs> if we think of many of our kids who have complexity, we think of them more like an architectural drawing. Well, you know, here's the layer where we run all the, all the um, beams. And this is the layer for the plumbing. And this is the <coughs> layer that we've got for uh, electrical. You know, this is where the walls will be going. <coughs> Our windows are on this, uh, on, on this over. Have you seen those onion skins that they put out for architectural drawings? 
And so we can't think in terms of either or. <coughs> we think in terms of what things are very likely to coexist. And what we find is almost all the kids who have that first year of life without a primary caregiver who is able to really keep them feeling safe. Almost all those kids are having trouble with theory of mind. Okay? And that's from some of the work from, that Mary Dozier has. If you Google her, she has a really excellent lecture that you can download on a website in which she talks about theory of mind. But we just find this ubiquitous uh, among those kids. But then we think, well, kids who are also experiencing neglect, they're lacking that safety, they're running very high cortisol levels. You know, the stress hormone levels are typically for developing children kept in regulation with the primary caregivers. And if, when I mean regulation, if you're not familiar with that, it's just like it's in sync with the primary caregiver. Well, when you think of who's neglecting a child like that, well, the, the norm, yeah, they're not regulated. The, you know, the usual suspects are, is it math, is it mental illness, is it alcohol, you know, is it polydrug use? What's causing this person to be so unbalanced that they're not caring for the child? So the person they're in sync with is so unbalanced that they're running unusual levels of stress hormones. And that also then affects attentional systems that are developing. Attentional systems, just attention. Some people say, well, that couldn't be my child. They can watch TV indefinitely. <laughs> and actually, and they scream if we turn it off. Well, actually, attention has to be adaptive. It's effortful attention, also flexibility in switching attention from one thing to another. Okay? And so that's something you have to be really careful about. If your child really can't turn off the TV, they become one with the internet experience. Well, they may have a strong future in tech, or they may have ADD. Okay. <laughs> but like the architectural thing, it could be both, you know? But see, I'm always looking for the gift there. You know, for the kid who's kind of glued to that, it's like there could be a tech experience with your name on it, kiddo, you know? So let's just keep you. Um, you know, let's keep you in a situation where we can capitalize on that. So I, let me move on here then. The child's bright but underperforms. The school has no plan. What are your options? And if you do just baseline school testing sometimes, the schools do um, the kind of testing that can be done within that setting with the amount of money we've decided as a society we can spend. You know, and that's, they've divvied it up so they're not doing what's called neuropsychologicals. Instead, they're doing more broad-based testing, and a lot of times you're not seeing uh, those intricate learning problems that we'll get with kids who are prenatally exposed. So if we think of children developing in those early years, or those early months, if we think of gestation when the child's in utero, see, you know, we kind of develop our main sensory strips, our main um, organ networks very early in gestation. And development goes from center out. And so, when we're in those, like, we're in the months that are um, like the second, third month of gestation, what happens when there's a real hit of alcohol? Mom goes out and drinks six drinks. What happens? Well, there's a massive toxic die-off of brain cells. And so if that's the point at which we're symmetrically laying out the neural tracks for vision, that gets hit. And so then we have a child who's 
got some visual difficulties. They're not focusing very well. When the auditory tracts are being laid out and there's a hit of alcohol, then those don't line up quite right. And then we find, gee, a lot of the kids are deaf in one ear, or really hard of hearing in one ear. Wonder what could have caused that. Or when those neural tracts are supposed to be all wiring together, so that when you look at something, you see, oh, you know, I see the directions that the teacher has on the board, so I'm going to take that visual information, then I'm going to send it over to my motor areas, and now I'm going to write it down, and then I'm going to remember to put that in my backpack and take it home. Do you see how many steps we have to do? But a lot of those linkages get separated, you know, in our neural networks. So the reason why we want to, I'm talking about this at some, such length, is do you think the schools as a group understand this? No, they wonder why this kid just won't comply and write stuff down. Or why won't they bring their book home? What's the problem there, you know? See, we had it right up on the board, but it didn't go from the visual center to the motor center. And then if we look at working memory, uh, I have a child right now who tests at 138 IQ. She's born prematurely. She didn't spend her first year in a nurturing environment. She's in a really deprived environment. So what do you think the teachers expect of her? Sick. High performance, right? Really bright kid. She has ADD and her verbal working memory is at one half of one percent. Okay, so everything's going to be visual for her. If you send it visually, she's in good shape. But it was a neuropsych that we did at seven years old that got her passing grades. Okay, now she's almost, you know, I don't want to give a lot of details, but she's She's doing very well in middle school. Um, she also has everything on the computer. But, go ahead, please, Yolanda. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're on. So I think the, the education part is where I get some of the most calls at Adoption Referral and Information Service because the, the schools and the teachers are as overwhelmed as the rest of us and really don't have the, the training for a lot of our children's needs. So one of the, I think, most important things you can do is start documenting. And I mean documenting. I, mean, I have a stack that tall with documentation on my kids. I mean, they're now young adults, but, but really documenting where you see concerns and where you see things, just curious things. And ask the teachers, I mean, obviously, or, or specialists or coaches or therapists or whoever you're involved with to do the same. Because um, what Deborah's talking about, the neuropsych, all of that can be so beneficial for a neuropsych to get a big picture. Those of us in the room don't have certain expertise, but the people that we go to have those expertise. So they're going to be looking at some of our documentation, and it's going to help them um, diagnose or not diagnose our children. And that documentation, if you get just really consistent with it, will show patterns. And, um, and you don't have to wait so long sometimes to get the appropriate diagnosis and whether it's medication, an educational plan, or, or something of that sort. So I can't stress that enough, the documentation part. Well, thanks so very much. And, you know, Yolanda has a referral and information service and a wealth of materials. So if you would just put into your search engine, Adoption Referral and Information Services, ARIS, Yolanda, <laughs> Yolanda Compron. You could just put you put adoption referral and information services errors and it will come up. Yeah. Um, so the neuropsychologicals we do seven, twelve, sixteen, and you know that will let you know what are your kids' strengths also. That way you can educate through those strengths. Um, then speech language ass assessments. Excuse me, speech language assessments. I'll come back to that in a minute. In a minute, I, I want to say a little more than less about that. But that's a, a really common area of concern. And then executive functioning. Does this class 
match my child's learning style. And you've heard me mention that high stress during early life uh, causes executive functioning difficulties. And just also, some people are slower to mature in that. You're going to have children who have never spent a day in, you know, an orphanage or a foster home who have slower executive functioning. And that will develop on through 25 to 28, and then you'll see that emerge as a strength for them. But with executive functioning, we're thinking of effortful attention, self-monitoring, working memory, ability to pre-plan, ability to organize oneself. You know, and so those are all things that are more difficult after children have been in high-risk situations. And if your child can't do those things, it doesn't mean, oh, all is lost. That you can adapt your environment and basically help them out. And um, the second book, that, or the, the last book that I read, wrote, Attaching Through Love, Hugs, and Play, has a whole section of how to make your home one that helps develop executive functioning. And then that second book, Nurturing Adoptions, I mean, you don't have to buy it, though my publisher would like it, but you can get one from the library. But the, uh, Nurturing Adoptions is about 80 pages, which includes a lot of information on how to help children who have executive functioning issues. Okay, Deborah, can I say this? Yes. Like the third book? So the third book, which is my favorite, uh, is, is so usable and so actionable and I read it right when it came out just a few months ago, and it made me want to um, adopt more children just so I could use those things and, and identify <laughs> things that I missed that I could have done really fun things. But I think it's a very, it's, it's paperback, it's easy to read and pick things out, but it's very actionable and, um, and easy to use. Attaching Through Love, Hugs, and Play. It's a much shorter book. It, they have it out of the bookstore, I think. Okay. But thanks for the plug for that. I'm at a different publisher and they've let me write a smaller book. So, I, it, it, well, it, a more parent friendly, you know, not so dense, just, you know, a, a, a lighter tone. And then check your sensory issues. A lot of our kids have sensory sensitivities. The world seems too bright or they can't sit so long without kind of losing their sense of balance in the world, you know. <laughs> Do you have some kids like this, or things are too too loud, and it's just too much for them? The engines just can't take any more, Captain. You know, and so we're putting them in situations that they have pre pretty fragile systems, and they just can't take the overstimulation through their senses. Weirdly enough, often they act out in the sense or sensory modality. They're the most it's the most difficult sensory modality for them to tolerate. So if there's too much movement that seems chaotic, they might be windmilling their arms. So you go in and talk to you know some school setting, and they say you're complaining about too much movement. Your child is definitely the chief of the culprits there. But it's just one of these you know, interesting situations. They seem to um, act out in the modality they have the most difficulty with. So I went into one classroom at a point where I was working with a child with FASD and couldn't figure out why he was having so much trouble in his classroom when he did so well the year before. But they had remodeled the school and put the furnace in the corner of the room with some drywall around it. He was sitting right back there so he could kind of lip, -y -lip on his chair, you know, <coughs> not distract everyone, which was a good idea, but the thing was there rah, 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 in the background. And so it was, it was just way too loud. His brain was full probably within the first two hours of the day, and he had to soldier on the rest of the day. So we found some ways to get away from those noises. So do, do check for the sensory issues. Um, Michael Behrens and Harry Shagani have done a lot of research in the area of post-institutionalized kids. And we found that half the kids from orphanages have normal IQ, half <laughs> don't, after they've been adopted to this country. 
But of the normal IQ kids, when given a neuropsych, have shown learning disabilities serious enough to interfere with learning. So that's a really, to me, a dramatic uh, finding on their part. So it causes me to err on the side of having more of those assessments uh, done rather than fewer of them. And just one other thing. A lot of our kids, if we have with the school run an IQ test, maybe the school will come up with an IQ of 80. Okay? And the child's not performing very well, they're behind, they're a slow learner. Will the school do much about that? No, because that's in accordance to their learning capacity. Whereas if we do a neuropsych and we find that if we correct for this, this child has normal learning ability and here's the disability, then we can get them to remediate. And so I'm always very keen on what are the un uh, use tools that we have in our toolbox for kids up till this point. Okay. <coughs> Mental health issues, let me move into that a little bit. The Harvard Casey studies done right here in the Pacific Northwest, mostly with Washington kids, found that our foster kids, uh, including those who had been adopted, had double the rate of PTSD of v Vietnam vets five times the rate of anxiety and or depression as typical for young adults. And, you know, we have a, just a, a real problem in our society right now with mood disorders. Uh, the best guesstimates are if we've got something that many young adults are reacting to in our environment because it's happening in industrialized countries. Uh, epidemiologists think it may have something to do with you know, our, what we're producing in industrialized countries. Nevertheless, what we're seeing is, you know, this high rate as compared to the norm. So, um, what we want to do is, I'm going to move, move a little past this. What we want to do is to be sure that we get our kids in for mental health services sooner than later. Some people wait, 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 wait. I'm not really sure why, but I think they keep thinking if we keep nurturing, that'll be the ticket. But when you have children who are four or five, by four you have children who are able to start trauma treatment. You want somebody who's trauma informed in their treatment, don't get somebody with kids who have executive functioning problems who does indirective play therapy. Okay? And I'll tell you why. Because they can't structure it for kids. Don't get somebody who's never done any trauma work who doesn't have trauma training. And don't get somebody who's going to leave six weeks into the kid's treatment. Get somebody who can stay with and get somebody who can do good trauma-informed therapy who has a background in adoption and attachment or foster care or whatever those issues are. Here, Lon, to help me out here. Sure. So uh, the majority of the calls that I get in, in, um, in addition to education is therapy for the, the child and we're, I think, I'm speaking to the parents of young kids and, and into middle school age. What Deborah said about getting early, I know families thought about it. Well, last year was a rough year. This year is a better year. What did, you know, we're going to change this. You get them in, and even if you don't end up long term, you have what I call having a therapist in your back pocket, and that someone who knows your child, knows your family, um, and if you have the neuropsych done and has the picture, so. And I'm going to say, so when you return, I used to say, if, you, if your child needs a therapist, I no longer say that. I said, when your child. And for the children who have been started therapy earlier, it's so much easier to get them back because they're, it's something that they're used to. So please, if you're thinking about it, um, do it. And if, you're, if, if the therapist who's really well trained and is the right fit says, oh, you know, right now, maybe not great, then you've lost nothing. You can go back. But um, 
the other part of that is, is that we as parents need to be trained to uh, be the best parents for our kids who have trauma. And again, like Deborah just said, uh, so many of our children um, can be diagnosed with PTSD. So there's so much learning for us to do, even if it's not something that our kids work on right away <coughs> when we access the, the um, trained therapist. Because that is one of the things that I see as one of the saddest things where um, families call and they're calling for their young adult children or their adult children and trying to get them into therapy and they never accessed it when they were younger and you can't force a, 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 an adult into therapy. And um, so if you have the opportunity and your kids are still young, I think it's gonna be um, well worth it all along. I have lots of people coming back in to see me when they hit a bump or they have a problem. And um, sometimes the 14, 15 year olds aren't really crazy about it. It's kind of like, you know, let, you need to take some vitamins here. But they're not saying no either. And it's important to know that in your state, in most of the states, kids have the right to say no to therapy at 14. And so if you're thinking, oh, I'll wait till the child's 13, it's going to be a tough sell then. Whereas if you already get through a lot of this stuff, you're in a lot better shape up the line. And then one of the nice things that's been happening is um, about five years ago, Brian Anderson, through Cascadia Training, partnered with me and we used some other instructors, but we developed uh, an attachment trauma postgraduate certificate program so we could do some training of therapists and caseworkers. Um, what that's done is it's graduated four classes now of attachment trauma therapists or casework. Some of them are in casework, like Spring Hecht is the uh, social services director for WACAP, um, <coughs> Abby Smith's. Uh, social Services Director for Holt, some of those folks came in too. However, we've got these folks now who are in around and now are taking these cases. And it's a program that's been now endorsed by the International Attach Organization. So it's accepted as one of the credentialed programs to prepare therapists to do attachment-focused therapy. So, uh, um, compiled a list of graduates that will be uh, over at Michelle's and I'll, I just compiled the list yesterday morning so I'll send you a list Yolanda but that will also well anyway I don't need to go on and on but you may be able to find a specialist in your area if you weren't able to before okay that my child has attachment problems get help ASAP if your child's in uh, domestically adopted or your child is in foster care and it looks like a long-term foster placement, especially if it's a foster care guardianship, foster <coughs> care, um, a kin a kinship placement, then you don't want to go more than about six months before you say, hey, I'm in trouble. Or even if the child isn't going to stay with you permanently and the child's in foster care and the child's not attaching, you know, you want to teach that child to attach to somebody and then eventually transfer that attachment. Um, if your child's been internationally adopted in year to year, you're not seeing strong attachment, again, you want to get an attachment specialist on board. Don't wait on and on. You know, because it, it, these are patterns of behavior. And over time, if you don't have a new pattern develop just spontaneously, then they're just going to continue on a different curve. You want to move them on to a, a, a more solid curve. And here's the nice thing about executive functioning. I talked about whoa, whoa, whoa when you have a hard beginning. But what we found is that for a lot of kids, we've got this window of recovery if we can develop a secure attachment with their caregiver. And so we start, that's some research done by the Oregon Social Learning Program through uh, Phil Fisher and his group. And now Mary Dozier's group at the University of Delaware has 
done this same kind of work with a group of at-risk uh, birth parents where they've been working on some of the attachment and they see like a, uh, a, a really nice settling down of the stress hormones and uh, she's also done this work with uh, foster parents where the child uh, in most cases stayed in the foster home. So we see this recovery then in the systems that instead of being really like high stress, they move on. My child lost her primary caregiver more than once. You're going to want to get therapy for that child, even if they seem over it. What we found is that high unresolved loss is directly correlated to teen depression directly correlated. And so we often think kids are over it, but they've just sealed it off. And it just sits there as a source of pain for them. You know, I was working with a boy who became very depressed um, this spring. And he said to me, I said I didn't remember anything from back there, but he said, I remember everything. And I remember how she left me for three days, you know, alone. And then I remember I went to foster care. I remember all of that. How hard is that for him to be able to grieve that loss? Enormously hard because when he tries to grieve it, he hits all that anger, all the neglect, all the <coughs> trust issues, you know. And so it's going to take a lot of assistance to grieve that process. We'll, we'll talk some about that, about my child's narrative tomorrow afternoon if you're with me during that, that time. So get some help from that because many of the little kids who are in seeing me or the middle-sized kids, they're in doing that kind of work. I had a girl who was um, adopted after her mother was murdered. And um, she corresponded with me uh, just recently and she said to me, I remember how you used to use the phone when we called heaven. She said, I really liked when we did that, when we talked to heaven. Well, do you think that that was helpful and soothing to her? Of course. You know, and so it's a way that we can, instead of having them in a situation where they feel alone in the circumstances, they can feel reconnected. They can reminisce about the person lost to them and they have some emotional support during it. You might say, well, why couldn't their parents do it? Well, the parents did, but they needed some guidance through the trauma piece. It, if I were parenting a child whose first mom had been murdered, do you think I would be doing the trauma therapy? No, I'd be completely overwhelmed with the feeling of what had happened to my own child. And so a lot of times we're so personally involved, it's really hard for us to do that for our children, which we wish we could do the, for them. Although I, I will go through some stuff that we can do for our kids tomorrow to help them with grief. You know, not everybody has such a horribly dramatic uh, story. Here's another one. My child stands still for a moment and looks frozen. What's that? Where your child could be dissociating, which is a sign of trauma, lights are on, nobody's home. Or your child could be having what's called absent seizures, where they just kind of stop and blink for a minute. Seizure activity is uh, higher among prenatally exposed kids, and so that would be something you'd want to have checked out. Okay. My child seems to be deaf. He can't remember three-step directions. Well, he could be like other people in your family, whether you're related or not. <laughs> a lot of you have gotten later in life and you still can't remember three-step uh, directions, but it could be that you need a speech and language assessment, that working verbally memory, working verbal memory is a problem here. There may, you may, may, may need speech and language help beyond that furnished by the school system. And if possible, lots of visuals in education. My child has tics. Neurologist, referred by the pediatrician. You know, you want to rule out uh, Tourette's syndrome. And if on medication and your child has tics, immediately inform your physician. And, you know, you'll, they'll figure out a way to 
bring your child off that medication if the medication is the, the issue. Don't fool around with that because that can be uh, very long lasting and a permanent problem after some certain medications. My child has OCD symptoms. A lot of kids will have OCD symptoms after they've been through tumultuous beginnings. And um, some of those seem to just melt away over time. But if it's clear OCD, then you'll want to see a psychiatrist for that and a specialist in cognitive behavioral therapy, not expressive play therapy or non-directive play therapy. Okay? It's very, you know, it, it, there's a certain protocol you want to follow. My child's easily overstimulated or understimulated, occupational therapy, and possible medication for the highly overaroused child. <laughs> so for occupational therapy, a lot of us, it's kind of a funny term. You know, it makes you, it sound like we're going to put like nuts and bolts together or something. But they just help a person's functions, function improve in breaking down the information that comes to them through their senses. They come up with something called a sensory diet and they help kids. Could my child be autistic? The first person to stop in to see is the pediatrician. They'll refer to an autism center or specialist. We get kids who are so shut down and so flat sometimes, we can't tell whether it's autism or whether it's severe neglect or trauma. You know, so, you know, sometimes we're still kind of, we don't know yet, but we do want to at least get the um, physician in the loop. These are some things with depression we look at in kids. It's not necessarily just walking around like this. That comes later. Uh, but irritability is a real hallmark. Low frustration for tolerance, hopelessness, they're guilty or accusing. They lose it and then follow up with thinking the family and the world would be better without them. No sense of the future being positive and they don't hold on to positive memories and achievements. If you're in that situation, then you do want to get some help right away. And don't hesitate to use medication, especially if you're more severe, because the spontaneous recovery from that takes about six months, and that's a long time to be in the trough. Especially for teenagers, we're finding that if they have uneven serotonin levels early, which is very common when we have childhoods with uh, neglect or trauma, then it's followed by a real drop in serotonin levels by teen years. You know, so sometimes we have to watch for that sudden descent. That's kicked me a few times where I've seen kids, fine, 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 boom. You know, and it, it's pretty scary when it happens. Um, I look for medication from the, you can have medication from your pediatrician uh, for depression. That works. Um, you can certainly use a psychiatrist. We use it in concert with depression if the depression doesn't clear within three weeks of therapy or if the threat of suicide is there then right away we're going to have medication with counseling and then my per child can't understand another person's point of view this is theory of mind that i was talking about before so what you're going to work with is a mental health practitioner who's able to build insight and empathy you rule it around autism, but the materials and approaches are often the same. I like manuals that can be used at school. You can also do things at home. Uh, we use relation. Have any of you used relationship development to intervention? And it, yeah, it's great, isn't it? Goodstein and Sheely uh, are the authors of that. There's one for young children. There's one for children, adolescents, young adults. Those are great materials. Go to um, some of the groups, the friendship groups like Wally's Club and so forth, that are meant for kids who are having a hard time understanding theory of mind. But we're building theory of mind a lot at home. A lot of these things I'm saying will refer to the professionals. This is one we do much better. I mean, you can use a professional, but you want to be doing stuff uh, at home all the time about this is what I'm thinking and feeling because of this or here's a script for this 
Or what do you think might have been that person's motivation? What do you think about this? But we really have to get that wiring going again. I have a girl I worked with at nine whose <coughs> parents thought she would be out of the home by adolescence. And now she's leaving her self-contained school to go to a, a mainstream school. I'm just delighted. But she's developing theory of mind. And, you know, it's so interesting that she can actually sit and think of other people's thoughts and feelings. And so it's one of those things that you start to, you know, really exercise with scenarios at home. You help them guess. When they say something insightful, you discuss it. You watch movies and discuss it. And you really build that at home. You know, when I first started with her, I would say things like, what do you think might have been, you know, her thoughts about that? She'd say, I'm empty, no clue, I got nothing, you know. And so we really started out from a very rocky ground. It didn't look like theory of mind was going to be growing anytime soon. Her parents were pretty tired. And uh, we were actually able to have a, a, a tutor, psychologically minded, uh, who started to go through the materials with her in home once a week. And so I've used that lots of times. I've used Navigating the Social World is another curricula by Jeanette McAfee. That's Navigating the Social World or uh, the Relationship Development Intervention. And I'll have uh, a really well put together teenager, young adult. I'm particularly keen on unemployed uh, young adults who are home for the summer. The kids like spending time with them. They're real attractive and fun to spend time with. It's not mom and dad saying it all the time. And they can coach them right through. And then I step them through the lessons. And it's a lot cheaper than some of the coaches through friendship skills group or somebody like me. You know, it, it works nicely. But with, with this um, theory of mind or feeling your feelings or guessing the feelings of other people, we help kids develop scripts, we help kids develop responses, we help kids with their guesses and do a lot of that practicing at home. And things that we, you would normally keep inside, these internal conversations, you say them out loud so the kids start to understand those. Well, some of you, if you'd had your child as a one or a two year old, you would have been saying things out loud and basically shaping their world. Well, by the time they came to you, they were past that stage and you were largely mute about some of that internal world. You stop that kind of talking aloud, but you have to turn the volume up sometimes and give them templates that they can work off again. Uh, I mentioned sensory sensitivities in a couple other places. Uh, occupational therapists you can use. Mosaic is a good one at the University of Washington area, and uh, they just do a wonderful job. They're especially equipped to help the needs of foster and adopted kids, take medical coupons. And you can go to this website, sensory-processing-disorder.com. You can download a sensory diet for your child and a lot of suggestions for the kids, including why doesn't my kid like that kind of texture in his food? Or why doesn't he chew? Or, you know, just a lot of things that parents struggle with. They have lots of answers to that. Okay. And I'm not going to go any further right then because I want just a little bit of time for Q&A here, okay? And I've, I think I've hit enough about trauma there. If your child has been traumatized, get help sooner than later. That, that's enough of that one. Okay. So, yes, please. Uh, i got two questions for you. Sure. So I want to go back to, uh, you mentioned intuitive early on, and um, my 13-year-old daughter has uh, ADD, um, and we found, like you say, that the stimulant-based medications really do not work. Um, she was on Shatera for a number of years, then, and we were happy with that, um, but my employer changed insurance, and now all of a sudden that's 
talk to you. I'm going to stop for just a minute. Repeat what you've said so that everybody can hear. Would that be okay? What he's saying is he wanted to ask a question about the in the in tune of uh, guamphacine, as you'll see it under guamphacine also. Uh, the, her, his daughter's 13. She's been on Stratera, which is not a stimulant, and that helped her, but she can't stay on it because of insurance reasons. Please continue. Yeah, so our, our doctor suggested Intuitive, and we're actually right now considering that. It sounds like you have seen good success with that, um, and I just kind of wanted to get, I guess, maybe you could compare those two together and what your what your thoughts are on the two, if you can comment. Well, um, I'm not a, an MD. But I am interested in how various classes of medication help children. And I found the intuitive is especially <coughs> helpful for the child whose systems are turned up so high they can't focus. And so Ira Chasnoff, in his excellent book called The Mystery of Risk, has a description of various medications that are particularly good depending on the um, uh, the stage at which the child was prenatally exposed. It's called The Mystery of Risk. And his name is Ira Chasnoff, C-H-A-S-N-O-F-F. -F. And he is from um, the Adoption res Resource or Research Triangle. I can't remember what the R is there in Chicago. He's been writing about and doing research in the area of drug exposure in children and outcomes for many years, probably 30 years. He's just excellent, has a sense of humor, and sees a lot of really great outcomes with kids when we adapt their surroundings. Do you have some things you would like to add, Yolanda? Um, I think there was another question. I another question, yes. Back to the verbal working memory, is that the same thing as auditory processing disorder? Auditory processing disorder is a larger camp that includes several things. And so you can have a child with auditory processing disorder so that they're not picking up everything that's said to them. Okay, unless they know the context already. Where you were diagnosed that one of my favorite places to go is um, the Capitol Hill Group Health. If they'll take you, Susan Fong is good there. But a good SLP, it, you could just get a good SLP to do it. But you actually want somebody who's able to understand it's not an articulation problem, it's not a hearing problem, it's not a vocabulary problem, it's a processing issue. Working memory, a, a child might be able to process speech just fine. The working memory is they put it into storage and it just goes away. And many of you probably have that experience, like when I'm busy, you know, there's limited real estate up there. People tell me something, and I can't remember it later. It's not shocking to me. And people say, you know, I said to my husband one time, I'm worried about my lack of fluency, you know, and what I'm forgetting. Do you think it could be early dementia? He said, no, it's not very nice. But, you know, when you went around the corner for years, the kids and I would laugh about this and call you Mount Prop Mama. And uh, you've always forgotten things when you got a little overstimulated. There's nothing new here. Just slow down. <laughs> you know? So, you know, we just, you know, this is why you have a long, happy marriage, kind of. You know? <laughs> I love to tell stories of my husband we just not on the premises. Anyhow, but I just realized my son is taping me, and I'm in, going to ask him to <laughs> So anyway, a little, a little. I mean, if you can't laugh at yourself, you you miss a lot of good jokes. So, other questions? Yes. I've heard a lot, kind of what you were mentioning about how ADD that it's a lot higher risk for that were prenatally exposed. I was wondering if 
that's the same type of statistic on that and other issues for infants that have been in a stable home rather than um, in foster care, like in different homes and all that sort of thing. If they've always had the same thing. You know, the question that you gave is an excellent one. What's the difference between kids who have had stable homes with that 76% ADD risk. I mean, how do they parcel that statistic out and and decide, you know, to what extent does that stable home protect the child from ADD? And I don't know the question to that, but I am so glad you asked the question because I'll go find it. Uh, the answer if I can find it. I'll see if they've been able to separate that information out. Uh, one more question then. Okay. Yes. I think it, I think you're the only one with a hand up. Yeah. I was wondering um, if what you can speak to around self harm and the research around that or the development of that. I have a six year old currently who experienced neglect early on, and what that will. We're starting to see some things. So some resources maybe. Sure. If you have a person <laughs> who's self harming, children do self harm to stop feelings that they have, or sometimes we have young children who feel like they need punished, and they're controlling enough that they figure out, gee, if I inflict just a little punishment on myself, then I'm in charge of the punishment there, we're good. But the other part is, typically it occurs because someone is feeling such strong feelings, they want to stop some of those feelings. You know, so they'll cut, slice, pinch, bang their head, and so forth. So you need to go work with someone around how to bring down some of those feelings. They'll teach you techniques that are appropriate for a six-year-old. And the second thing is, you would want to see if there's something that's triggering that little one. Some memory system that's triggered, some fear that's being triggered that's keeping them in a constant agitated state. Okay, and, and occasionally we find a child, you know, because I'm making this more than just your case, we have a child who's overstimulated enough by the environment. You know, they just really can't take everything that's going on. And they will do that. I'm going to stop what I'm feeling by cutting, pinching, banging my head, you know, biting my hand, whatever. I'm going to stop that because I'm being overstimulated. And so if we can reduce the sensory input, we have a child who stops doing that. But I would be teaching them tools. I have a whole bunch of tools I give to kids. And um, there's a section in that new book on it, and um, that attaching through love, hugs, and play. But Elizabeth Crary has a set of cards that you can buy online and their self-calming skills. And they've got little visuals, little pictures of kids, and they're hugging themselves, give myself a hug, shaking it out, you know, just different breathing that they're doing. And I use those cards with kids at that age and they really like the cards. Those ca the set also is bilingual with Spanish. So, you know, you can use them for kids who are Spanish speaking. They like that they have the cards in that language. Okay. Elizabeth Crary, C R A R Y, and the cards. I think they're called self calming skills. And there's one more question. I'm going to go over anyway and just answer it. Go ahead, make it quick, or else come and talk to me after. But if people want to just kind of walk out to get to their next thing, feel free. Okay. So if you bolt, I'll keep talking and I won't take offense. Go ahead. Yeah, is she in therapy? Yes, but it's not. Um, I don't think the therapist understands attachment. I gave her your book, actually. <laughs> wait, wait, ever, I'm so glad. Ask your therapist to arrange for a consultation with a therapist who understands this problem set. 
And if you CC me and put in the subject line, consultation, if I don't have room, I will refer your therapist to someone else who's good in this area and who will consult with your therapist. Okay? Because it's a, it's a pretty big problem. You don't want to just let this go. Okay. Thank you so much, our wonderful audience, and I appreciate it.